Pull this over. Can you hear me? Testing, testing. All right, guys, on YouTube, if you can hear me, let me know um, in the comment section below. Just chat that up and let me know, guys. If you're on Facebook or any other platform, we're over on YouTube, and you can just go to Smart Money Bro on YouTube to join in in this conversation. If you can hear me, guys, let me know that you can hear me by giving me a heads up um, that you can hear me. I'd appreciate it, and we can get this ball rolling. And um, what we're going to be talking about, guys, is we're going to discuss the Fed, kind of a warning to all Americans regarding inflation and what we should be doing right now to ensure that we're ready for what is about to take place in terms of the Fed and the Fed's upcoming moves and so forth. So um, that's what we're talking about, right? Then I'm going to talk about things that they never tell you, really. They don't go over these things in plain language for you to understand, but I'm going to try to break some things down to you in plain language so you guys can see and understand what we're talking about. Again, if you can hear me, let me know that you can hear me. And uh, we're going to have this conversation, so buckle up your seatbelts, guys, because this is going to be pretty important information and um, something that you want to try to understand. But let me know that you can hear me by giving, leaving me a comment, if you can, in the chat section if you're on YouTube. If you're not on YouTube, you may want to go to YouTube because I'm going to be sharing my screen in just a bit uh, as I talk about some of these things. So it's all about what's going on in terms of the Fed. And things that you likely have not heard, have not, exp have not had explained to you in layman's terms, I'm going to be putting this stuff in plain language for you so you can get it and you can understand. At the end, we might go ahead and take a few questions and <clears throat> just have that conversation. Let me get a chug of water. Old school cup. So my goal on this live is to help you understand money just a little bit better. Right. From a, a overall standpoint, what's going on? <clears throat> My overall goal on this channel at Smart Money Bro on YouTube is to help you guys learn more about how money works and how our money works and what we should be doing and can be doing with our money. So I want to thank you guys, first of all, for being here today. Thank you for showing up. Um, and it looks like you guys can hear me. Let me know what city, state, uh, country that you're located in, because we always have folks in here from around the world. So I really appreciate that, guys. If you can just let me know where you're from in the comments section on YouTube, that would be great. Would appreciate it. <clears throat> but I'm going to go a little deep here, okay? But I'm going to do it in a way, again, that's plain language and easy to understand. Guys, do me a favor. Also, as you come in, smash the like button for me. Please share this video, this link to this video with family, friends, loved ones. You know, turn your notifications on. Please subscribe if you're not a subscriber. Um, let's see here. Okay. We got LA, Los Angeles, several people from Los Angeles. We got North Carolina, Philly in here. Tim G. I see you. Elsa. I see you from San Francisco. We got, uh, Eubank from Texas. Atlanta's in the house. Good to have you. We got some more Texas folks. Good. Raul from Las Cruces, um, Raleigh, North Carolina. It sounds like we got folks from all over Dayton, Ohio. Okay. Northern California where it's about to get cold. Good. Illinois is in the, in the house. South Bend, Tony Ward. Good to have you, Tony. Daryl is out in L.A. And uh, got Ribeiro from uh, Brasilia. And then we have Jackson, Mississippi. And we got uh, Lufkin, Texas. Diane from Lady Die from the U.K. <laughs> we got Angela from Houston, Texas. Awesome. Good to have you guys in. Oh, Tony's from South Bend, Indiana, I see. Uh, we got uh, Christopher checking in from Ireland. Good to have you, Christopher. Uh, hope all is well out there in, in Ireland. Um, so we got folks from all over, guys, all over the world. Usually there's a South Africa that jumps in here. There's a Georgia. Uh, sometimes we get a Ghana. We get an Australia. So it's good to have you guys, and I hope you guys really get something out of this video, uh, what we're going to talk about. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help you understand a lot of what you see all the time happening around you. It's going to help you understand that a lot better. Um, don't forget to smash the like button, share the video. Um, and uh, don't forget, in the, in, on YouTube, in the description box, we've got 24 Laws of Money that is free, my gift to you. <clears throat> it's free. It's about the 24 rules or principles of money that shape my philosophy uh, along in my uh, personal financial journey on my way to financial freedom. Um, it's my gift to you for just being a part of this live YouTube broadcast. Um, if you click on that link in the description box, <clears throat> you'll get it. And if you're not on YouTube, 
you know, if you're watching this later, feel free to get it. I'll leave that link down there. So let's jump into it, guys. It's like we got folks from uh, still checking in from North New York City and Merlin. And uh, we got somebody named Common Wolf from Mars. Fantastic. Good to have you all the way from Mars. Wow. <laughs> That's a good one. That made me laugh. All right. So here's the deal, guys. <clears throat> the Federal Reserve has been sending some really subtle messages in the last few days, not just com- and not just coming straight out <clears throat> and saying what they mean, but they've been sending these messages. <clears throat> so what we got to do is we got to sort of read between the lines a little bit with these messages. So that's what I want to help us do. Um, don't forget to smash the like, hit the thumbs up and share this. I think we're on LinkedIn. <clears throat> we're on Facebook. We're on two Facebook groups. We're on the, the private smart money bro group. We're on the remnant. Uh, Facebook group as well, and we're also, we're not on IG, but uh, you can share it on IG. Um, But the more you share it, the more you hit the like button, the more that pushes it out to more and more people. Uh, By the way, the Federal Reserve launched its IG page this week. They're now, just now, right, in 2023, at the end of 2023 in October, the Federal Reserve is now on IG. They have an official page on IG, believe it or not, at Federal Reserve Board on IG. Um... Just something to think about in case you wanted to join the Federal Reserve. But I want to talk about what I constantly keep hearing from Fed chairs this week. Chairman Powell, and then it was he did a sit-down conference, and then it was echoed again by the Fed chair of Cleveland. Uh, I think her name is Mrs. Mester. And again, it was talked about by the Fed chair in Atlanta. <clears throat> the, his name, I think, is Mr. Bostick. And everything that comes out of the mouth of the Federal Reserve, guys, you have to understand is scripted. Okay, because there's 12 Fed chairs, just so you know, there's 12 Fed, Fed districts in America, and, and the Fed is pretty much a propaganda machine, okay, because they know what they say has the ability to sway markets, right? If they say this, they're going to sway the market one way. If they say that, large investors, institutional investors are going to pull their money this way. So they're coached and prompted on exactly what to say and how to say it Um, and how many times to say it before they go in front of the public. So they are super duper careful. And all they do a lot, although they do a lot of talking, you'll hear the Federal Reserve or Fed Fed chairs from different districts come out. They're very, very, very measured with what they say. All right. The Federal Reserve is very much a propaganda machine because they have to, their communication has to be top notch. What they say to the public has to be, be top notch because you're dealing with people's money, right? So I also want to talk a little bit about this market and and that we're in and how it could be affected by what the Fed does in the next few weeks with interest rates and why that means something to us. Because basically, guys, there's three phases to life when it comes to investing your money. Okay, three phases. There's that accumulation phase when you're adding money and adding money and you're building wealth and you're building wealth and you can take the most risk, right? You're usually a little younger, 20, 30, 35 years old. And then you have the second phase is that transition phase when you're right at that pre-retirement area and you're seeing how you're going to use your funds for fulfilling your goals and stuff like that. That's when you can be half risky and half careful. And then, of course, there's that, that's that distribution, distribution phase, right, after retirement when you want to start to use your money, right, when you want to start to actually live on the money that you've accumulated and you've saved and you invest it, right? This is when you're about... 45, 55, 65, and you're looking to retire and figure out how you're going to use the money, and then you want to retire and use it, right? The question, though, is what stage are you in right now in your life? Because personal finance is personal, right? There's a few absolutes, but everybody's situation's different. So let's, 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 let's jump into what I'm hearing from the Federal Reserve, because that really makes a difference in where we are in terms of those phases of life, right, in terms of our money. Um, in the last several days, uh, about the funds, the Fed funds rate, uh, that's, it's, it's going to be pretty interesting to us, and especially us as investors. And it really should spark some concern for some of us that are at that distribution phase, right, where we're trying to collect our money from what we've invested all these years, right? Now, if you're at that stage where you're accumulating money and all that stuff, then if the Fed goes ahead and raises rates soon, you're cool because that means the market's going to dip and you're going to be investing and investing. But there's a lot of people that aren't at that stage. There's a lot of 55-year-olds that are trying to pull their money out and live on their money or 65 or 75 or 85-year-olds 
that are trying to live on their money. And so when they see the stock market dip, that's a dip in their cash, right? That's an issue. So if you're trying to grow your money, cool, invest in these dips, right? As the Fed begins to possibly continue to raise rates. But if you're trying to use and withdraw your money from the stock market right now, then the Fed raising these rates, that's a reason to pause because somebody's trying to pay their mortgage right now. Somebody's trying to pay rent. Somebody's trying to buy food to live on and don't have a regular job like they used to. And so they're relying on that $75,000 that's sitting over in the, in the stock market, right? Or in some brokerage account, right? They're relying on that. So it's very important. The Federal Reserve has been super duper duper hawkish on raising the federal funds rate one more time this year. Now, they meet again, the federal, the Open Market Committee, what they call the Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC. They're going to meet again in, um, I think, October 31st and November 1st. They're going to meet, and we're going to see what they're going to do. Now, when I say the Fed has been hawkish, I'm saying that the Fed has sort of dug their heels in, uh, in the sand, right? What do hawks do? Hawks hover and watch, and in other words, the Fed is in full support of potentially raising interest rates. And I keep hearing this over and over again from these Federal Reserve chairs, right? In order to, they want to raise the rates to keep, in fighting, keep fighting inflation. Even if it means, you know, economic growth and unemployment is going to take a hit. We'll talk about unemployment and, uh, later, on, later on because unemployment is a very interesting piece of this whole thing. And so they've been very hawkish about maybe increasing rates again when they meet the stock market has priced in just so you guys know i think the latest data said the price the 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 stock market has priced in a 75 percent chance that the fed won't raise rates and only a 25 percent chance that the fed will raise rates now me personally i think the fed is going to raise rates again and i'll talk about exactly what that means in plain language guys now tomorrow we're going to get the unemployment numbers i think the un that was kind of in jeopardy based on what happened last weekend with the, with the government almost shutting down. Since the government didn't shut down, they're going to go ahead and release their unemployment numbers, I think, tomorrow. And that should be interesting, and it'll have a huge effect on what's going to take place in three weeks. Now, I, don't, now, I can go into how unemployment is affected by the rates, but I think I'll hold off on that. The Fed doesn't mind seeing unemployment go up, just so you know. The Fed is okay with unemployment increasing. If unemployment has been at 50-year lows, guys, for the last, I don't know, 8, 9, 10 months, 3.5%, 3.8%. Um, but the Fed is okay with that going up a little bit, right? In fact, if the unemployment rate goes down a little bit, then the Fed will be more apt to raise the rates again. If the unemployment uh, stays the same or it goes up a little bit, then the Fed will be more apt to not raise the rates because the Fed kind of wants to see unemployment go up. And if they don't see it go up, they'll probably increase the rates. We'll see. My opinion is that, that I think they will. So again, good news for us investors. Um, that would be good news for us investors that are at the, in the accumulation stage of life, right? We're taking risks because we're going to see the market go down, stock market go down, and then we're also going to see uh, excellent time to buy, right? So um, right now, we have a lot of things to think about in terms of the U.S. economy, guys. A lot of numbers and things happening, and all this has a trickle-down effect on us and our money, right? Right now, for example, we got a $33 trillion national debt. It was raised this past summer, right? Uh, highest national debt, obviously, that we've ever had. Matter of fact, it's going up by about $2 trillion a year. We have a $2.2 trillion deficit, actually a $2 trillion deficit basically every year at this point. That means basically we spend two trillion more than we bring in. Okay, we spend two trillion more than we actually take in. So we're operating in the red as as a country, right? And that's one of the issues there was that had that was on the table this past weekend with the whole debacle about maybe closing down the federal government, um, and it was also on the table this last summer when they were fighting to not. Some people were fighting not to raise the debt ceiling. And, um, you know, so it, it, it's that's a it's a real issue that we need to think about and talk about and understand a little bit. We also have had in the last what year and a half, maybe a year, a little over a year, we've had the 40 year highs in inflation. Right. Remember last year, I think last June, headline inflation was nine percent. Right. Nine percent inflation. That means prices were going up at a rate of nine percent a year. Price of bread, price of whatever. Right. That was, that was um, CPI, right, headline inflation. Core percent, I think, was around 7% last year. 
So, you know, just so you know, the the Fed looks at the core PCE more than they look like, look at the headline PC, uh, headline inflation. Headline inflation is what we see that's reported, right? The CPI. But the core is what the Fed really looks at closely. The the core the core inflation right now is around 3.9%, down from about a little over 7% last summer. Okay? So you guys know Still, 3.9% is higher than the 2% inflation target that the Federal Reserve wants. So inflation is going down. We know it's going down, but it's going down really slow. So, by the way, the headline inflation is the inflation that includes food and energy, which they say is more volatile. So the core PCE inflation, the second measure of inflation, is the one they look at more closely because they say it's a broader measure of inflation because it removes food and energy takes out those outliers and it's it looks at deeper measures of inflation so point being another thing taking place i'm trying to lay the found lay the groundwork here we also have 20 years high, year highs in terms of the fed funds rate or the interest rates guys just so we're clear the fed funds rate is the rate that banks commercial banks charge one another when they lend money to each other overnight okay so overnight, they're lending money to each other to replenish, et cetera, and so they're charging a rate to each other. That rate that the banks are charging each other is the federal funds rate. That's what the Federal Reserve controls. Right now, it's at between five and a quarter and five and a half percent. And when they meet in three weeks, that's what I think they're going to raise by about 25 basis points or a quarter of a percentage point. Um, because, and they're going to make it more expensive to borrow money, right? And that means short-term loans from, you know, are, are going to go up, right? Credit card interest is going to go up. You want to go borrow loan, auto loans from your bank, it's going to go up because when banks have to pay more to get the money from each other, they pass that on to us as higher interest rates for short-term loans, right? So as we dive a little deeper, guys, don't forget to smash the like button. If you're not on YouTube, I'm going to share my, my screen here in just a moment. If you're not on YouTube, you may want to jump over to YouTube to see my screen. Uh, don't forget to smash that but that 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 uh, like button below, guys, and don't forget to get your 24 laws of money in the in the description box below and share the video. Now, like I said, in my opinion, there's an excellent chance that in three weeks the Fed is going to increase that Fed funds rate by 25 basis point because they want to continue to squeeze the economy, right? They want to continue to make it harder and less attractive to actually go out and get some loans, right? So when the cost of money or the Fed fund rates go up, again, short-term lending rates go up to cover them, right? Again, they have to pay a higher cost. Guess what? Now we got to pay a higher cost. So the Fed has been raising rates, obviously, to do what, guys? Fight inflation, right? They don't raise rates because they hate you. They don't raise rates because they want you to suffer, um, they don't raise rates to put more money in the hands of, listen, they just, they just raise rates because they want to slow down the spending and kind of shrink the, uh, our spending, right? Now, we've all, let me just be point blank with you guys, all right? We all have been trained to be consumers, and we've been trained to be borrowers, point blank. Let's just keep it real, right? Because if we're borrowers, borrowers and consumers, we're keeping the machine running, right? And what do you have to do? We've been trained. What do you have to do to anything that you train? Right? You got to contain it. Right? You got to contain it. Believe it or not, I hate to say it like that, but it is what it is. So you have to train and you have to contain what you train. So, you know, although we're humans, I get it, guys. We're not animals or robots, but we're trained to buy stuff. To buy and buy and buy and buy stuff we stuff we need, stuff we don't really need, stuff we just want, right? So the Fed tries to raise these interest rates. Now I'm gonna try to explain this to you guys. The Fed's gonna raise these interest rates to manage what they think is our spending, right? They try to manage our spending so that our spending doesn't get out of hand. Now, what happens when our spending goes up and up and up and we spend and we spend and we spend? What ultimately happens, guys, is inflation um, or the rise of cost of goods and services goes up and up and up. Sort of the nature of the beast. It's not bad. It's not good. It just is what it is. I'm not going to say it's right or wrong. I'm not going to say it's good or bad. That's for you to decide. But that's what happens, right? 
We spend, we spend, we spend, inflation goes up. Not just us, but obviously businesses, everybody is spending, not just individuals. Now, I'm just going to explain to you what happens, guys. So let me show you what they never really talk about, what they never really show you sort of in layman's terms. Let me see if I can't share my screen, guys. Bear with me here. I'm going to share my screen and show you what I mean just to kind of break this down a little bit further. All right, there it is right there. All right, if you're watching me, guys, on YouTube, you now see a chart in front of you. Let me make this thing a little bit bigger so you can see it. And I'm right here. I'm going to make myself even smaller so you can blow it up. You can barely see those numbers, and I know it's difficult to see, but I'm going to hope that you can see them somewhat. Uh, matter of fact, I'm going to get out of that screen and go to a bigger screen because I think there's an easier way for you guys to see it. So give me a second here. Let's see. Nope. Okay. Let's present. All right. So let's go to this one because this is going to be bigger and you can see the, the numbers better. Uh, okay. So you should be able to see my screen right now. And on this screen, you see years at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to break this down because I really want you guys to understand what happens with the Fed and what they never really talk about. They always talk about the infl the, uh, the Fed funds rate and all that stuff, right? But they never talk about the balance sheet, okay? So I'm, if you're on, if you're on uh, YouTube, you see a balance sheet in front of you. So on this chart, if you, can, if you can kind of get a gander at this chart here real quick. So on this chart, you see, as I've got my cursor right here, you see that we're right here in 20, we're right here. This is where we are as of the late September of this year, right? So what happened, guys, at the start of the pandemic, the Federal Reserve sort of fronted us a lot of money at the start of the pandemic. And they did that to do what? To stimulate the economy when everything shut down. And the result is that spending went through the roof. Now, here, here we are right here. This is the pandemic right here, 2020, if you guys can see my, my, my uh, cursor right here. So this is where the pandemic started right here. And by the way, the Fed has a balance sheet, meaning that the Fed has assets and the Fed has liabilities. The Fed is not federal government. The Fed is not a government agency. The Fed is a corporation, right? They've, they're a corporation that, that has been given certain mandates and certain abilities and power through the government, but they're not a government entity. Just make sure we understand that. So the Fed has a balance sheet where they have assets and liabilities. What we're looking at here is their assets, the total amounts of their assets. Over here, you see this right here. This is in trillions right here. And over here, this is the years at the bottom of the axis, right? So if you notice right here at the start of the pandemic, everything shut down, right? So everything shut down. When everything shut down, everybody was staying at home. Nobody was buying a whole lot of stuff or going to a lot of places, right? The economy, they had, they had to... They had to inject money into the economy, right? And so, and so this is, and as you see, their balance sheet went up, right? It went up from here to here. This is their balance sheet. And it kept going up all the way until about the summer of last year. And then their balance sheet, their assets started going down. There's a little hiccup right there. I'll tell you about that in a bit. But just imagine, I'll say it like this, guys. Just imagine if you owned a hat company, okay? And all of a sudden, everyone wanted one of your hats, right? Everyone had money in their hands to buy your hats. Well, are you going to, as a business that owns hats and sell hats, are you going to now keep the prices of your hats the same? Or are you going to lower prices now that everyone wants your hats and everybody has money to go buy your hats? Are you going to keep the prices of your hats the same? Or are you going to lower those prices when the demand increases? Of course not, right? You have a business. In fact, demand may go up so high for your hats that you're not going to lower the prices. You're going to probably increase the prices. And matter of fact, you're going to actually go out and get some help. You're going to hire somebody to actually pay them to help you to keep up with the demand. Everybody's got money. The demand is high. And so your hats are $10. You're not going to keep them at $10. Business says you're going to increase those prices, right? Because you have to, and now you have to increase your price to pay for this additional labor that you got, right? You just hired somebody to help you produce and manufacture these hats. So your hats go from $10 to about $15, right? Doesn't necessarily mean your profits went up, 
right? By the same. Of course, they could, and they probably do. But you now have more wear and tear on your machinery. You have more maintenance on your machinery. And you have this new employee you got to pay. So now your hats, demand is out there. Everybody's got money. You raise the price of your hats from 10 to $15. That's what businesses do. And that's what happened when demand increases and everyone now has the money to pay for your hats. You increase the price of your hats. And that's why when you throw money at an economy and put the money in people's hands, like it stimulates the economy, right? When everybody has money to buy and the demand goes up, prices are going to go up, but you're giving everybody money to stimulate the economy, to make people start purchasing and purchasing, right? The Fed, they understand this, right? So to, now they didn't, now, now what happened was prices went up and 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 these fast increases in prices, otherwise known as inflation, now they have to sort of pull the pin on that. And sort of take the air out of the economy that they themselves blew up, right? The Fed's policies blew the economy up and it made prices go up and prices go up. And now they got to pull the pin, right? And so they said, we need to make money, money more expensive now to borrow, to slow down consumer spending, right? And when they make money more expensive to borrow by raising interest rates on short, short term loans called the Fed funds rate, it slows down spending among us consumers less spending by us as consumer means what less demand for goods and services and less demand for goods and services means the prices of goods and services will ultimately go down as well and deflation or inflation should decrease right that's kind of how it normally works so let's say all of a sudden everybody couldn't afford your hat because your hat is too expensive and you know and it costs too much money to borrow money for your hat now Right. Because you had to raise you raise you didn't have to, but you raised the prices of your hats to twenty dollars. Right. And now the hats are more expensive. And I don't and, you know, I don't want to go out and borrow more money as a business because I can't. Money is now more expensive for me to borrow, too, as a business. So I can't replace equipment. I can't hire more people. Right. So now when people stop borrowing the money to buy my hats, now I have to decrease my prices of hats. I can't sell them at fifteen and twenty dollars because nobody's buying them. Because money's too expensive to borrow to buy, to buy my hat, so to speak, right? So I have to decrease the price of my hat if I want to stay in business. And I probably have to unload that worker that I brought on. I can't pay them anymore because my greatest expense as a business is what? Labor, people. So I lay, I lay these folks off. That's why unemployment goes up when interest rates go up. When it's harder to borrow, it's harder for me to keep labor. When it's harder to borrow money and money costs so much, six, seven, eight percent to borrow money, then I got to get rid of my most heavy expense. That's my labor. That's why unemployment goes up too, right? Unemployment goes up when rates go up, right? So that's kind of how this all works. The Fed doesn't mind inflation. Again, they just want 2% inflation instead of 4 or 8%. They want the prices to go up because that keeps the economy growing, but they only want it to go up their target rate. And there's a lot of reasons it's 2%. I can go into all that, but I won't. 2% is what they're targeting. So back to the chart. Let me show you what I'm talking about on the chart so you guys can see this. During the pandemic, the Fed basically printed money out of thin air. Just if you didn't know that or nobody explained that to you or you didn't get that on MSNBC or Fox or CNN, whatever you watch, the, the, the Fed has the power to print money, right? They just print money. And if you notice right here, I'm going to show you this right here on the chart, guys, if you're still looking at the chart. During the pandemic, the Fed basically doubled, right here, you see they doubled their assets, okay? By the way, you see what happened down here, guys? I'm going to explain this too. This is in 2008 when the economy sort of went bad because of the housing crash and all that stuff, right? That, that happened to their, this is their balance sheet back then. Look at it. It's almost the identical thing that happened in 08 on their balance sheet that happened during the pandemic, the beginning of the pandemic on their balance sheet, right? So, the Fed basically doubled the size of their assets on their balance sheet at the, at the start of the pandemic by buying a ton of bonds and purchasing what they call MBSs or mortgage-backed securities, which are just bonds, treasury bonds. They purchased a ton of bonds, right? And everyone, also at the same time, everyone got a stimulus check, right? And got, got PPP loans for businesses and all this stuff, right? Everyone got money, right? So everyone got money 
And the Fed purchased a bunch of bonds to increase their assets, all in the name of trying to stimulate the economy in the first few months of the pandemic. And you see it right there on their, on their uh, balance sheet. How do you stimulate an economy? You put money out in the economy. I'm going to tell you exactly how they put money out in the economy. Okay, The Fed flooded the, the, the markets, the, the, the U.S. economy, with money. Right? And I'm going to explain how they did that in just a second. Since then, they've been working frantically to try to scale this thing back and undo a lot of that by letting a lot of bonds roll off the books. If you look at the chart right here, you notice we're going up, we're going up. They're adding bonds. This is just the Fed buying bonds, right? They're buying bonds to put money out into the banks in the economy. And right here, look at that right here. Look at the, the top of when we were doing this. It's the summer of last year when our, when our, when our, uh, our inflation was at its highest. And what have they been doing since the summer of last year? They've been lowering their assets on their balance sheet since the summer of last year. There's a hiccup right there. I'm going to tell you what that is in a minute. But they're trying to now unload the bonds that they purchased at the start of the pandemic, right? The central bank, again, it doubled its borrowing over the past couple of years to, you know, impact the pandemic and put money out into the economy. They were at $4.3 trillion on their asset side in mid-March of 2020, and they went all the way up to $9 trillion in assets at, in June of last year. And since June of last year, they've been trying to unload bonds, right? Since, it, since inflation was at a 9% high, headline inflation. So the high point from now. Now, the Fed has two, this is something you, you got to understand. The Fed has two ways that they control inflation, guys, two ways two ways that they're working on. One way is the interest rates, right? We see that all the time. We're going to see it in a few weeks. They're going to raise the interest rates to make borrowing more expensive. We talked about that. But no one hears about the other way, which is to control the money supply using their balance sheet, right? And printing money to inject into the economy or getting rid of bonds to lower the liquidity in the economy, right? They don't talk much about the balance sheet. No, 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 no. They can't talk about how they simply buy bonds from banks and lending institutions in order to add money to the money supply. When the Fed buys bonds on the open market, it increases the money supply in the economy. That's why you see what happened at the beginning of the pandemic on that chart, right? So that's where the Fed is just simply buying bonds, meaning they have more assets. When you buy a bond, you're adding to your assets, Right. Just like if I went out and bought bonds. Right. I'd be adding it to my assets like my stocks and my bonds and my real estate. Right. Stocks, bonds, real estate. So how does this inject money into the economy? Because they swap out the bonds in exchange for cash. Hear me what I'm hear, hear what I'm telling you guys. They swap out the bonds. They buy the bonds for what? Cash. Remember, I said they print cash. They print cash. Use that cash to go buy bonds. They buy bonds from people like banks. And they give the banks, in return for the bond, they give the bank a month some money. We'll get there. So the, on the flip side, now when the Fed sells their bonds or gets rid of their bonds, which they've been doing since June of last year, trying to get rid of them, they decrease the money supply because that removes cash from the economy. Guys, in practice, it basically looks like this. In 2000, 2010, 2011, when the Fed rate was cut down to zero, the Fed funds rate was down to zero, it they couldn't, they didn't, they didn't know how they were going to reduce rates even further to encourage lending, to encourage banks to lend money. Remember, we spent 10 years or so with super duper low interest rates. There was a reason for that. They were trying to put, you know, it, they were trying to infuse money back into the system, right? Back into the economy. When they reduce the Fed funds rate, it encourages banks to lend money. Reducing the Fed funds rate means they can, that banks can now uh, lend us money for cheaper. So when they reduce the Fed funds rate, it encourages banks to lend money. And when they raise the Fed funds rate, it discourages banks from lending money, like what's happening right now. Who wants to go out and get an 8% loan? Who wants to go out and get a pay 20% on their credit card? Very few people, right? And so they're discouraging banks from lending money by raising the rates. So around 2011, around that time, the Fed started what they called, and you might have heard this term, it's called quantitative easing, QE. 
Everything I'm talking about is just QE, right? <laughs> and they begin purchasing these mortgage-backed securities and other treasuries called bonds to keep the economy from freezing up back then. And that's exactly what they did at the start of the pandemic. They used quantitative easing to sort of keep the government and I'm sorry, to keep the economy up and running. We got a bunch of money. Like I said, we got a bunch of money in terms of stimulus money. Now everybody's got money in their hands. And the Fed at the same time, they didn't tell you this, but at the same time, they went out and bought a whole bunch of bond, bonds. And when they buy bonds from a bank, they give the bank cash. Now the cash, now the banks have more money and they're more open to lend because they want everybody to spend. They're manipulating our spending, right? So the, the Fed, in simple terms, the Fed creates dollars out of thin air and then they buy the bonds with cash that many times they buy those bonds from large banks. So when the Fed buys bonds with cash that they print it, they print this cash from the U.S. Treasury, they print it. When they buy bonds with it, the Fed now has an asset called a bond on their balance sheet. That's why you see on the balance sheet these big old spike, this big old spike right here at the start of this pandem pandemic. They added the bonds to their balance sheet, right? And now, and now the banks have cash on their asset side of it it's not really cash but it's cash on paper right that's why you know so that that's kind of what happens right fed buys bonds with cash from large banks and banks have more cash in their books and now more lending is now open to the public to to stimulate the economy right right it makes us want to go out and get a loan two percent loan what four percent three percent man we're going out and getting doing all types of things getting all types of automobile loans at such low rates right that's our thinking because we've been trained to buy, 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 and to buy when rates are low, when money is cheap. Okay. So, so that's just something that I'm just trying to give you a nutshell, in a nutshell, kind of how this whole thing's work, thing works, right? Because what happens when cash is in our hands as consumers? When we have more cash in our hands as consumers, we tend to do what? We tend to spend, right? That's why we got stimulus checks. It was to spend. It wasn't to hold or to pay off debt or nothing like that. They gave us money at the beginning of the pandemic so we could spend that money to stimulate the economy. Right? Two things were happening. The Fed was printing money and buying bonds with that money and putting cash in the hands of banks so they could lend more money to us. And at the same time, number two, the government was giving us money in the form of stimulus checks to go also go out and buy stuff. And then the economy boom, booms, even though nobody was leaving their house, right? Because rates were low. There's lots of spending we could do out there. Banks were being friendly to us. Come on in here. You can get this loan. The government was giving us loans, right? Giving businesses loans, right? The result of all that is inflation. Now, we can get all political if we want. I don't, I don't want to dig too deep into which side and which side. I don't, do, I don't really do that. But the result of all of that was inflation. You can't inject four trillion dollars into the economy without thinking that there's going to be some type of result of that some type of inflation and what happened was of course at the same time we started buying and therefore when we start buying what i say earlier demand prices went up no business at the start of the pandemic had a hat company and said i'm going to all of a sudden lower my prices of hats right no everybody got money i can go borrow money for my new equipment i can go borrow money to pay this new employee i'm going to go borrow some money we're going to all spend some money and now my hats are not going to be ten dollars and fifteen they're going to be twenty dollars and that's why and they're going to keep being twenty dollars as long as everybody can pay and think they can pay and act like they can pay i'm going to keep raising the rates of my hat the prices of my hat so now what we see was we all that we see a reverse of everything i just said now that's not happening anymore. Now the Fed is trying to get rid of the bonds and they're trying to raise interest rates to discourage you from going to borrow, telling you to stop spending. And if you look at their at their at their this this chart here, guys, we hit a peak. The the the, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet assets hit a peak summer of last year. It just so happens at the same time, not just so happens, it's not coincident, it's because our inflation had reached a peak. 9% for headline inflation, 7.5% for core inflation last summer, right? Highest it had been in 40 years. So the Fed said, you know what? We got to start, we got to start tightening it up. We got to start, we got to make sure we raise these interest rates up, keep raising them 
to make it harder to borrow money for businesses to borrow, for individuals to borrow. We got to make it harder and we got to start letting these bonds roll off our balance sheet. We got to get rid of these bonds. Right. Because now we got to We put so much liquidity into the into the, the economy. Now we got to pull back a little bit, take some of this liquidity out of the economy, raise interest rates. Right. Charge higher rates for put the, you know, short term rates as credit cards, discourage folks from using credit cards. But of course, we know that credit card uh, debt is at an all time high, just hit over a trillion about a month ago. Right. But they want to discourage some of the borrowing. And actually, quantitative easing is when they uh, buy bonds and inject money into the market. Quantitative tightening, what the economists call quantitative tightening, is what's happening right now. It's the opposite of QE, right? I don't want to get too deep into economics. I'm not, an economic, I'm not a professor. I'm not an economics guy. I just kind of understand what's going on and trying to explain that to you guys, right? So you see the balancing act. They buy bonds and banks have more cash to loan money. That stimulates the economy. And then we got to a peak. And they got to now scale that back and raise rates and let those bonds roll off their balance sheet and stop the spending. That's the game of money. That's the game of money they don't really explain to you in layman's terms when you're watching Bloomberg or you're watching CNN or you watch. They give you these quick sound bites that are quick, or you're looking at on the scrolling on the internet, right? Right, because we're just cogs in this machine. Our spending and our inability to spend and borrowing and inability to borrow are all controlled by Fed policies that are pulling the strings, right? Now, by the way, guys, you see this little hit right here on this chart? I want to show you this right here. See that hit right there in March of this year where it looked like the Fed was letting go of all their bonds and selling their bonds and getting rid of their bonds, right? Then they had this hiccup. That's when those two banks, in, in, uh, those two banks failed. That's what happened. Those two, when Silicon Valley Bank and the Signature Bank of New, York, of New York failed in March of this year, they suffered two of the largest bank failures in the history of the U.S. People started pulling their money out of regional banks, and that forced banks, in order to stay afloat, the banks had to go get loans from who? The Federal Reserve. The banks, all re, you know, a lot of regional banks, there are large regional banks, they said, oh, my goodness, Signature Valley, uh, Signature, uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank uh, failed. Signature Bank failed. Everybody's panicking. Now we got to go get loans from the Federal Reserve to stay open. And when the Fed lends money, it's basically buying a bond. That's why you see that little, that little sharp go up right there. Because the Fed had to buy bonds in exchange for, for, you see how this whole thing works. They had to buy more bonds again. Right. And put more bonds back on the asset side of their balance sheet. Right. And a bond, just so you know, guys, if you don't know, if you don't get anything else from this whole broadcast, remember this. A bond is a loan. Every government, every city, every state, county, municipality, large corporation, et cetera. Right. Including large banks. They sell bonds for one reason only. OK, never forget this. They sell bonds simply to raise money. They have to raise cash. That's why they sell bonds, okay? It's simply to raise money. So when a large bank needs cash, they sell bonds to get the cash. And at the start of the pandemic, they were selling those bonds to the Federal Reserve. That's why the Federal Reserve added bonds on their spread, on their balance sheet. And in return, banks got what? Cash. Because bonds is, a bond is just a loan, right? And every, when, when you, listen, when you go outside your, in, in, your, in your street and they're building a new school down the street, they had, to, they had to issue bonds for part of that building, right? So because they had, to get a, they had to raise cash to pay for it, right? Or you see a new hospital going up, right? They had to, raise, they had to, they had to, they had to sell bonds to get cash to do it, right? All big businesses, uh, uh, countries do it, right? America does it too. America has U.S. Treasury bonds that we sell to other countries, right? Other countries come and buy bonds from us, right? Or, or if that makes any sense, right? So banks sell bonds to the federal government. A bank is a corporation, so banks have to raise capital, but like, like AT&T sells bonds, right? So, you know, all big businesses do. So anytime they want to raise money, they have to issue bonds, all right? So, um, who do you think is buying those bonds, right? It's not me and you. We're not buying all these bonds. We do sometimes, small investors. But you have institutional investors that buy bonds, 
right, that are big active players. The bond market is bigger than the stock market, right, just so you guys know. It's bigger than the stock market. So, um, it's, and it's very complicated. It's not simple. Um, so, I don't want to go too much deeper into that. This is how money works. And until you understand some of this, guys, it's easy and simple to point the blame and complain and get mad and get angry at all of this stuff, right? But sometimes we just don't really understand what is taking place, right? Stop sharing my screen, guys. So we don't really understand. But the Fed knew good and well and when, and well when they were injecting all this money into the economy that it would have an effect, and that effect would potentially probably be inflation. It was, it was pretty much expected. Guys, these are brilliant people. They understand what's going on. They know some consequences. They're not perfect, all right? Let's, be, let's make that clear. They're not perfect with their policy. And there's a lot of people that don't like their policy, right? But, uh, you know, they just rely on us not knowing or not knowing or caring, not caring uh, what's going on. So um, let me see something real quick here. So that was a lot to ingest. Guys, don't forget to smash the like button, by the way. Smash the like button. Share this video. And at the same time, uh, make sure you're picking up your 24 laws of money. By the way, I do want to say this because this is important. Um, this live is sponsored by Mint Mobile, right? I'm partner, partnering with Mint Mobile recently, and I do have Mint Mobile service. Love it. Everybody's walking around with a phone, cell phone, guys. Shop around and pay less. You shouldn't have to pay $150, $200 for a cell phone, $75, $80 bucks for a cell phone. Mint Mobile has plans for as low, premium wireless plans for as low as $15. Bucks. So, and you don't have to sacrifice speed, data, none of that type of stuff. They keep the cost low because they, they don't have employees. I'm sorry. They don't have uh, retail stores, right? They don't have the overhead of paying, re paying, paying for retail stores and salespeople. So they don't have that. So you can get a, a, a solid network and solid premium wireless plan for only 15 bucks and they they operate on the world's largest 5g network by the way so i got a description of that in the in the uh, box below as well you can click on that but so let's keep going i mean this is really important guys and i want you guys to understand that on this channel we talk about a lot about personal finance and we talk a lot about our money but part of understanding our money is understanding how we fit into the the, the machine that is the federal government, that is the machine of the Federal Reserve, right? Because we're a piece of this whole puzzle, right? The other, other things we have going on right now, guys, is we've got mortgage rates. Think about mortgage rates are, are hovering around the 8% mark. I think they hit over 8%. They might be back down now, but below 8%. But mortgage rates are high. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there was a downgrade in the U.S. credit rating, only the second downgrade ever. I think Standard & Poor did the, did the first one back in 11 or 12, and then uh, Fitch came through and done another one uh, just this past summer. Um, foreign holders of our foreign debt, meaning who has purchased U.S. bonds, and now the U.S. government owes them back. Remember what I said about a bond. A bond is a loan. If Brazil comes into America and buys a bond from us, right, now we owe Brazil money back, right? So the, the, there's a lot of foreign holders of our federal debt, that thirty-three trillion dollars I was talking about earlier, um, does anybody know the lar the, the one government in the world that that the that that owns the largest amount of government bonds, U.S. bonds, U United States government bonds? Who owns the largest amount of bonds? What one country owes us and has purchased more of our treasury bonds? Uh, somebody said China. No, it's not China. One country. Now, there's five or six or seven countries that a lot of our debt is owed to. But does anybody know the one country that, has the, that, that we owe the most money to because they own most of our, they own a lot of our debt? Everybody's saying China. No, China's not the answer. Although China is up there in the top five somewhere, right? But China, China is not the one country that, owes, that owns most of, not, not most, but they own the most debt of America. Anybody know? Anybody know? I see China. Oh, lazy cat. Got it. It's Japan. Japan owns over a trillion dollars of our debt. They purchase more bonds from us, treasury bonds, than anybody else. Remember, a bond is a loan. We owe Japan more money from our debt than anybody else because Japan owns over a trillion. China's up there. I don't think India's up there in Saudi. Uh, I'm not sure where Saudi Arabia is, but I know China's up there high. But Japan owns a trillion dollars or more of our debt. The other thing that's going on, guys, you got gas prices going up, 
right? OPEC Plus reduced the supply of their production of oil, right? OPEC Plus is that group of countries that want to want to run and control and the supply of the oil that comes out of their ground, right? Um, and sometimes they're looked at as bad guys, but they're not really bad guys. I think they just want to control their their resource, which is oil. Um, U.S. crude oil in the SPR SPR is the petroleum reserve stocks that we have in America. It's our backup plan, our emergency oil. Um, it's down by a hundred barrels for, since last year. Last October, the executive branch of the federal government, the president said it remained that they 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 were going to pull from our strategic petroleum reserves. In, because OPEC Plus came out and said just in October, like days before the election that took place last November, OPEC Plus came out and said, you know what? We're going to cut our supply of the oil to 2 million barrels a day. And immediately, within a couple of days, the president said, oh, we're going to open up our strategic petroleum reserves to help you know, get us more oil to keep the prices. Our, our, now, we're a year later, we're still down 100 barrels, uh, 100 million barrels or so that from that strategic oil reserves, which is where we go to in case of emergency. Um, so that's what happened. The government almost shut down a couple of weeks ago or a week ago. You know that. Um, and the Speaker of the House a couple of days ago was removed from his post. So there's a lot of things going on. Right. Right. And of course, the government almost shut down because of those 12 funding bills that hadn't been funded. And they haven't been funded on time for 25 years in a row, by the way. Uh, 130 straight continuing resolutions. Um, uh, so not a good look, right? So there's a lot of issues going on that we need to be paying attention to that are going to affect the Fed's next decision coming up in about a week. Uh, I'm sorry, about three weeks, late October. And it's going to affect our money, right? We're sort of the fall guy on some of this stuff, right? Um, now, there, let me just say this. I don't want to say that everything. Now, unemployment is pretty good. As I said earlier, unemployment is at a low, 50-year uh, lows in the last six months or so. So unemployment looks good, and that means we kind of have a strong economy to an extent, right? Um, and then economic growth has been, you know, better than a lot of folks manage, right? Six months ago, we were talking about, man, by the time of October, we're going to be in a recession, a hard recession. That, that hasn't happened, right? We, so we had better economic growth than anybody thought, and the, the, ec the uh, economy seems very resilient. So I'm assuming— that all of these things, really, if you look at all the turmoil and you look at the numbers that's coming out to, uh, for the jobs coming out, the unemployment rates, I think tomorrow, you know, I, I think they're going to raise interest rates. I can't say. Again, I'm, I'm in, the, in, in the minority here because I'm one of the 25. The stock market's only priced in 25 percent that say they will raise rates. Um, but I just think they will. I got a good feeling. Like I said, I've heard from the Federal Reserve uh, of Cleveland chair, Mrs. Mester. Um, she said if the economy looks the way it did in the next meeting, um, I would do a further rate increase. She just came out and said that this week. And, of course, I said, as before, the Atlanta Fed chair came out and said, hey, we need to stay vigilant, right? He's using terms like vigilant. And, again, listen closely to what they say. When you hear a Fed chair from one of the 12 Fed districts say anything, it matters. Because, again, they are a propaganda machine. They know that what they say sways markets and controls billions of dollars. So they're very careful about that. They are trained carefully, right? Two weeks ago, the Fed chair, Jerome Powell, came out and said they would keep interest rates steady, and he suggested that more rate hikes were on the horizon this year. They have two meetings left this year, okay? Um, so, um, by the way, let me, let me see if I can do this real quick. I want to share something else with, with you guys on my screen, if you don't mind, real quick in this live guys i'm going to share this with you real quick because i want to point out what i was talking about because i just found it so let's go here and let's go here if you're not on facebook i'm not sorry not on youtube you probably won't be able to see this but you can probably see my screen right here um, domestic holders of federal debt okay domestic holdings of federal debt have increased notably over the past decade rising from six trillion dollars back in 2011 to 17 trillion at the end of 2022, the Federal Reserve, I'm just reading right from this article that I'm highlighting here, the Federal Reserve, which purchases and sells treasury securities, which is a fancy word for bonds, as a means to influence federal interest rates and the nation's money supply, is the low, largest holder of such debt. Did you hear what I said? Domestic holdings of federal debt, right? Domestic holdings of federal debt. Who owns $17 trillion of the federal debt? Who does the government owe? 
right here in this statement right here, it shows you domestic holdings of federal debt. Who's the hard? Who's the the largest holder of federal of a of a federal debt? It's the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is the largest holder of federal of federal debt. In other words, in other words, are you hearing what I'm saying here? I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. What I'm sharing with you guys. The government owes the Federal Reserve, who again is a corporation. The government owes the Federal Reserve seventeen trillion dollars. Because the Federal Reserve is the one of the, is the largest domestic holder of federal debt, domestic holder of federal debt. Understand that, guys, right? How does that think about that for a second? All right. So these are things that get tucked away in the back of a story. They get tucked away in an article because. And, and these are things that we don't really quite understand because we, you know, we don't read the fine print and they just don't really put this on the front page of, of CNN, right? They're going to put something else, some other distraction on the front page of CNN instead of educating people about what's actually happening and what's actually going on. The Federal Reserve is the largest domestic holder of government debt, the $33 trillion I just mentioned to you. The government owes the Federal Reserve because, again, a bond is a loan. The Federal Reserve has loaned money to the government. Not thinking about the fact that the Federal Reserve had the U.S. Treasury, the government, print the money. Interesting stuff, guys. Interesting stuff. So your job, as I always say to say, is prepare, prepare, prepare. Right. Look at everything happening with a third eye. Keep investing, keep dollar cost averaging, keep your resume updated. Who knows what's going to happen with jobs, right? Keep gathering skills, keep learning, keep watching this channel because I want to break this stuff down to you guys in plain language. Let me know in the comments, guys, is this type of information helpful for you? Let me know that, guys. Also, you want to keep paying down your debt on depreciating items and keep being on the lookout for ways to increase your income. The Fed is unloading their securities right now, their, their bonds, what they call a balance sheet runoff, which basically means they're reducing their assets and letting securities or bonds roll off the asset side of their balance sheet. That doesn't mean that we need to be unloading our assets, though, right? In fact, it means we need to be adding to our assets, our appreciating assets, right? Taking the depreciating uh, asset called a, or liability called a, a asset. It's a depreciating asset called cash and exchanging that cash for appreciating assets that are going up in value. That's what we should be doing with money and decreasing our bad liabilities, getting out of debt, right? That's the way you play this game is stop playing the game they've laid out for you as a consumer, as a non-saver, as a non-investor and a, and a consumption machine, of a bunch of things that in the end don't matter. That, that's how you play this game if you want to win this game, right? Your goal should be to see your assets go up and your liabilities come down, way down, way down to nothing if you can, right? You can play the credit game if you want or you don't want, right? Totally up to you. Or you can choose to sort of step aside and play a different game. But pay attention to what's happening. And if you want to get out of this hamster wheel, understand what's happening with the money, the money supply. The Federal Reserve, because they, you know, when you go to a new job, they always say, make sure you pay attention to the money, pay attention to the money right here at home, right? Sometimes they get real fancy, quantitative easy, easing, quantitative tightening, right? All these fancy words, but it's not that fancy, right? It's not that fancy, okay? Guys, don't forget to comment, like, share, subscribe, right? Because on this channel, we want to break this stuff down in plain language. Don't forget also to get your 24 Laws of Money ebook free in the description box below. Check out also in the description box Mint Mobile, largest 5G network in the world. Plans as low as $15. You can't beat that. Okay. Let me just take a look at the comments, guys. I got a meeting coming up as you can, uh, you might have saw, but so, uh, first two minutes, channel, I'm already learning. Excellent. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad this was helpful. Some of you are saying this is helpful information, helpful way to break it down so it's not so complicated. Lala from Morocco, good to have you. Um, yes, money is magically created, and then that, man that money that's magically created is now 
They take it and they go buy bonds with it. Anyway, so that's kind of how this whole things work. I hope I was able to give you guys sort of a breakdown in a very easy to understand way of putting it. And if you don't, hey, go back and replay this video, right? So, um, whoa, somebody said they paid five fifty nine and for their gas wow huge yeah so i appreciate it guys i don't have a lot of time for q a today on this live but as you guys know i come on thursdays at 4 30 p.m i may come on in between there to do another quick live but i'm also going to be on the live saturday morning at 11 a.m central standard time 11 a.m because we tackle situations we tackle money issues for our personal self as well as these larger issues dealing with the economy so be on the lookout for that I'm going to end the live now, guys. Um, not a lot of questions, but I'm going to end the live. But I just wanted to, I hope I was able to help you guys understand something. Smash the like button and let me know in the comments section that this was helpful for any of you. Just let me know, guys. I always look at the comments and I read the comments. So um, I appreciate you guys being here. This channel has grown tremendously and it wouldn't have grown without you guys. So, you know, pat yourself on the back. I give you guys a huge thank you. So, uh, so uh, for you guys actually um, being a part of what we're doing here and trying to bring just regular money, common sense, down to earth money stuff to regular people, you know, helping ordinary people like me and you be a little bit extraordinary with our money and with our understanding of money. Right. Um, so I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Thank you, Angie and Mike. Good to have you guys. Uh, James, Natasha, I appreciate you guys being here. Thanks so much. As I always say, the best person who's going to take care of the old you is the young you. Guys, take care of yourself. Always take care of you, but also take care of other people. All right? Until the next time, guys, I appreciate it. Peace.